became enlightened and shared the teaching until he died at the age of 80. But there's also the Buddha within ourselves who transcends space and time. This is the living Buddha, the Buddha of the ultimate reality, the one who transcends all ideas and notions and is available to us at any time. The living Buddha was not born at Kapilavastu, nor did he pass away at Kushinagar. So he's talking about this living Buddha that we may also know as Buddha nature, Buddha mind, the awakened mind, the enlightened mind. So as we'll hear later from Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings, resurrection really means in Buddhism becoming alive to who we are. This resurrection, it's not a belief. In Buddhism, it's really our daily practice. And we've been practicing again this morning, again, as Maria Teresa has reminded us, to come back to awareness, to let go of fabrication, to let go of the past, to let go of the future, come back here to the present moment, to our true home. So this is resurrection. Resurrection is particularly important at times like this, where we can so easily be caught up in worry and fear about what's happening in the world. Resurrection, this coming back, this coming alive to who we are, will help move us towards dissolution of fear, worries, stories, and all that bring us suffering. So in thinking about this topic over the last few days, I reflected on how my understanding of life, death, and resurrection have really transformed over the years as a result of encountering the Dharma up through today in this current virus pandemic. And, you know, I realized that this understanding, which I'll talk about, has brought me so much greater ease with death, much more appreciation for life, and really an increased urgency and diligence for practicing in order to live from this place of aliveness, of resurrection, instead of from my thoughts about life, which only brings suffering. So I'll start talking a little bit about, maybe start with death. And as I reflected, I kind of scrolled back to my pre-Buddhist days where, you know, I thought the meaning of life and death was quite simple. If you were breathing, you were alive. And if you weren't breathing, you were dead. <laughs> and I really didn't think about it beyond that. Because, hey, I was young. And, you know, death was something unknown to me. Hadn't been touched with really in my family. And I thought, that's something to think about when you're old. So I lived my worldly life. And it, was, it seemed like a really wonderful worldly life. So by August of 1995, I was 38 years old. I had a career that I loved. I had my husband had just been promoted to partner at his firm. We had an 11-year-old son who was happy and healthy. You know, we thought we were on track. Actually, we thought we were ahead of track. <laughs> we were really, you know, felt pretty good about that worldly life that we had. Everything seemed to be happening as planned or even better. And then I got this call at work from my younger sister saying, you know, our father has just died of a heart attack suddenly. He was in San Francisco at Alcatraz with my mother. And I'll say as an aside, through, even though I was, had much grief at the time, it got to be rather amusing that um, my husband got great delight when people would ask him where his father-in-law was when he died, that he would tell them he was at Alcatraz. Um, Alcatraz actually wasn't holding any prisoners at the time. <laughs> he was there as a tourist. <laughs> but people would have a very uncomfortable look on their face, um, hmm, wondering if my father had been a prisoner at Alcatraz, and he wasn't. He was actually 63, he's the same age that I am right now. So I thought this is an interesting time to be reflecting very near the time that my father actually physically died and left this world. It just totally rocked me in such a upheaval, um, such a very difficult way for me when this happened. This wasn't part of my plan. Um, I had had a relationship with my father that when I was an adolescent was quite stormy. We were both quite headstrong. But as I became an adult, you know, he became the person who, you know, apart from my husband, was the person I most wanted to go to, to talk about life, 
to talk about career, to talk about whatever important came up. Uh, he also, having had three daughters, finally having a grandson with my son, he was a wonderful grandfather. He had the best fishing buddy in the world um, with my son. He played so many roles in my life. He was, you know, father, grandfather, career advisor, family protector. He was also opinionated, hot-tempered, <laughs> you know, prone to getting upset easily. Um, all these things. And just overwhelmed me with just first shock, then denial. This just, you know, this, I've never thought about this. You know, I never reflected on death. How could this be happening? And then just this great grief that many of you have probably also felt when suddenly somebody's not part of your life anymore and there's this hole and you want to turn and tell the person something. There were so many things I wanted to discuss with my father that I had never gotten to. You know, even problems with our relationship when we were younger. And I thought, oh, I'll talk about this with him in the future. You know, I always thought there'd be this future, but suddenly there wasn't any future. So, you know, it was quite difficult for me. You know, where did he go? All of a sudden I had all these questions. You know, I was really probably rather agnostic, if not atheist, about life at that point. But suddenly I thought about my father telling me his idea of heaven would be that we are just this energy moving through the universe that's all-knowing. He loved knowledge. <laughs> so I really had all these questions all of a sudden that I hadn't had before in my life. So everything changes in the face of death. You know, death can be a wonderful catalyst for us to make us stop, to really be a catalyst for spiritual awakening. Or we can just, you know, not question it and the experience can fade. For me, it really woke me up from this immersion and this worldly life that, you know, for the most part was pretty good. You know, I really hadn't because I think because I wasn't suffering, I didn't have a reason to question life and death and meaning. But when something like this happens, it can really wake us up. And suddenly I thought, you know, what is the meaning of life and what does death really mean? So I started searching. I started reading, attending lectures, and that's how I really came upon Buddhism beginning to read Buddhist books, which really resonated. So several years later, through the encouragement of friends who are dear Sangha friends to this day, I attended my first retreat with Thich Nhat Hanh and received transmission of the five mindfulness trainings, which we just shared. And I began to step onto this actual path of practice. I was so fortunate all of us in Tampa who were practicing together, the small group of us at the time, were so fortunate to find a teacher in Fred. And Fred taught us. He taught us many things, but included among that was that we need to hear the teachings, reflect on the teachings, and practice the teachings. And he liked to use the example of someone who wanted to learn to play a musical instrument, such as the piano. We could read books about playing the piano, we could watch videos about playing the piano, but that would not make us a pianist. <laughs> if we sat down, the only way we were really going to become someone who could skillfully play the piano was to play, was to practice. So that really then began this journey of practice. Over the years, since my father died, since I began this practice, there have been so many Buddhist teachings that have really shifted my view of life and death, and even, you know, really what does it mean to be alive, or what does this resurrection mean? One of the teachings that was the most significant, and I think for many of us, is the teaching on impermanence. While we want to come back to this place, this home, we want to rest and this awareness, oftentimes we're so full of thoughts and stories, misperceptions, that we have a difficult time. So Tibetan Buddhism very helpfully teaches us about turning the mind by looking at the way the world really is, and in particular in this area, as, respect, as, as pertains to death, I found that the teachings of impermanence were particularly helpful. 
So most of you are probably very familiar with the Buddha's teachings on impermanence. Most of us know this intellectually, that everything is constantly in a state of coming together and falling apart. And things come together because the causes and conditions manifest to make something appear. And when those causes and conditions stop manifesting, then whatever has appeared changes and something else becomes evident and manifest instead. So there's nothing that exists by itself. Everything arises because of something else. So there's just this continuity of life, nothing permanent. And probably the best example of impermanence that we can all experience is our body. So this body did not just pop up, didn't just pop into being and show up one day. You know, our body's a result of the union of the egg and the sperm of our parents. And so before conception, those causes and conditions had not come together but they were manifesting as causes and conditions. They themselves were results of our parents' ancestors coming together. So there is this constant coming together that manifests in this body. And since we've been alive, the body has changed. Cells are dying and being reborn every day. The body is constantly changing. The body ages. The body gets sick. And at some point, either through cells dying, either through a new cause, which could be a disease, a new cause that could be an injury, this body will cease to exist. And what was the matter of this body will then transform into something else, return to the earth. So we can see these causes and conditions that create this continuation. And for many of us, if we have children, then there's a continuation of this body through those bodies. Even with what happens in the mind, all of our speech, our actions, all of these become causes that create effects in the world. So Buddhism teaches that everything is impermanent. We're not solid like we tend to see ourselves, but we're constantly changing. And so we get that intellectually, but we don't often really stop and reflect on that. And it's not just our bodies. Our relationships are impermanent. Think of people who were in your life who are now gone our opinions, our feelings, our likes and dislikes change. There is nothing that is of any of the phenomena of the world that is not subject to change, that is not arising and will eventually pass away. So this is a very important realization for us to really support where we'll go with resurrection, to really stop seeing the world as fixed and permanent, but to see it as changeable, to see that winter becomes spring, that a seed became this flower, that in another week this flower will wilt and will go back and become compost in the, in the earth, that even when our sun runs out of energy and scientists tell us about five billion years, the earth will cease, but then planets on the outer edge of the solar system will warm and become habitable. So just Everything, no matter how small, no matter how big, is in change. So stop for a moment, if you would, perhaps just close your eyes for a moment, and just reflect on the truth of this teaching of impermanence in your own life. Think about the changes in your body over time, the changes in your health. And consider the many people who were in your life when you were young who are no longer here. They've passed away, they've moved away. So 
So this is a reflection on impermanence that our teachers encourage us to do often because we get it intellectually, but then we find when there actually is a loss or a change, we suffer, which is telling us that we're not getting it deeply in our heart. So this is a reflection. We want to see the impermanence over and over again, not just on the cushion, but as we walk around life and just begin to see things with those eyes of impermanence. The teaching of impermanence holds a very important lesson about our suffering. Because when we realize that everything is constantly coming together and falling apart, we realize that trying to fixate on anything, whether it's our bodies, another person, our material wealth, is just going to bring us worry and disappointment and fear because everything will change. So how can we try to grab onto something that by its own nature is always going to be changing? So if we don't see that, we suffer. And this lesson has really helped me when others have been ill or passed away or there have been issues of my own health. It's been very helpful this past month to see the causes and conditions that have arisen in this world that cause the contagion with this COVID-19, the causes and conditions that came into being that supported its spread, and continuing to look at, you know, where we are today with this virus. So understanding what's happening is very helpful, and it doesn't mean we don't take all the precautions we can to protect ourselves and our loved ones and everyone we can. But we don't have to be excessively thinking about this and fearful. We want to understand this is why this happened. Okay, what can I do now? You know, what can I, is there anything I can do to help? And actually, there is something we can do to help, and I'll talk about it a little bit during announcements. But, you know, just being there for somebody so that's where we want to go, not into the worrying mind. I think this teaching of impermanence also gives us a much greater appreciation for the preciousness of life. When I look at this flower that's on the teaching table, it's quite beautiful. You know, I could have a flower that's a silk flower that looks just like this, that looks exactly like it. And my smell's not that good, so I probably wouldn't know the difference if you put the two of them in front of me. But when I know it's a real flower, there's much more appreciation because I realize this won't last. This is manifesting right now and will not be here forever. So just like talking to a, a friend, a loved one, hearing their voice, seeing their face, you know, these present moment experiences that we have are precious. And so when permanence helps really make the moments that much more precious, when we really understand impermanence, we don't take life for granted. So coming to the topic of resurrection um, from this perspective, so we know these teachings. I would imagine that most of us online, we know that illness happens. We know we probably know a lot more about natural disasters and pandemics than we've ever known since this began. <laughs> we know there have been many pandemics in the past, many plagues, many you know, things that have really um, caused a lot of people to die and, and taken people's health away. So we know these things happen and we know they come from causes and conditions, but we continue to get swept away by afflictive emotions. We continue to worry and fear. So why, when we know these teachings, does that happen? because we live in the world of thought. <laughs> Instead of living where we continually are being told by our teachers to come back and rest in the present moment and experience life directly, instead of living in our thoughts about life, we forget that and we just get swept away. We become the worry. We become the fear. We don't like the uncertainty. We want to plan. We're trying, it's so uncomfortable because we're so identified with those thoughts and those emotions, and it makes us very, very uncomfortable to be identified with them. We don't see that we're so swept away, 
and we want to do something to make it feel better, and it just results in extreme agitation. When we come back, when we can at least come back to awareness and maybe be aware that there is worry arising in the mind, just the fact that we notice that there's an awareness of being worried puts a little bit of space in there. Suddenly, I'm not the worry. I can rest in that awareness, that awareness that worry has arisen in the mind. So this is really our practice. This is really our practice of resurrection, is not getting lost in what's happening. So this is where our meditation practice becomes so important, that we really very diligently and persistently practice coming back to this mind that's calm and quiet. And when we do that, and we've all had probably some taste of that, we experience this mind that's steady, that's unchanging, that no matter what is happening, whether the mind feels thoughts are busy, thoughts are quiet, there is this more pervasive awareness that is always clear and calm if we don't cover it over and get lost in our thinking. It always has these qualities of compassion, of luminosity, of seeing things clearly, of kindness, of wisdom. So this is present in each one of us, and when we're not lost in thought, it shines through more clearly. When we rest in this place, of calmness and this awareness and this Buddha mind, we see what's arising with clarity and we can respond with wisdom and compassion instead of our habitual reactivity. As Thich Nhat Hanh describes, we become alive to life. We're reborn in that moment that we touch that mindfulness and awareness. So this is the Buddhist meaning of resurrection. Resurrection occurs in that moment when we wake up, when we come back to this awareness, to this mindfulness, when we're no longer lost. So I'd like to share some more of Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings here. He writes about the ritual of baptism, aimed at helping people touch the seed of the Holy Spirit that is already in him or her. And he says, this ritual is undertaken to help someone to be born in his or her spiritual life. So this is the ritual of baptism, help someone to be born into their spiritual life. The same is true for someone who practices the Dharma. Every time you touch the seed of mindfulness and mindfulness manifests in you, life is possible again. In a state of distraction, body and mind are not together. If you're lost in the future or in the past, you're not alive. And remember again in her guided meditation, Maria Teresa, you know, ask us to let go of thoughts of the past or planning of the future. Come back to the present moment and be alive. That's what we're practicing. When the seeds of mindfulness in you is touched, suddenly you become alive body and spirit together. And again, these are Thich Nhat Hanh's words. You are born again. Jesus is born again. The Buddha is born again. And again, he's talking about this living Buddha, this Buddha nature, this Buddha mind that we all have. Thich Nhat Hanh goes on. When you hear the meditation bell, you stop your thinking. You stop what you're saying. And the bell rescues you and brings you back to your true home, 
where the Holy Spirit and mindfulness are alive. There you are born again. You were born several times a day, thanks to the Sangha surrounding you. This is the practice of resurrection. We die so many times a day. We lose ourselves so many times a day. And thanks to the practice, we also come back to life several times a day. Redemption and resurrection are neither words nor objects of belief. They are our daily practice. And we practice in such a way that Buddha is born every moment of our daily life, that Jesus Christ is born every moment of our daily life. And this was, you know, a talk given, I think, to a, a joint group of Christians and, and Buddhists. So this resurrection is very interesting. And it occurs at different levels. So we don't have to be the Buddha to experience resurrection, which is good for myself, I'm sure, and for many of you too. But we begin at the level of mindfulness. You know, I'm aware that I'm drinking my tea. I'm aware that worry has arisen in the mind. And often at this, at this level of, of mindfulness, at this level of resurrection, there's a resting, there's a coming back, a pulling back from identification with all the phenomena of the world. And yet in this awareness, there's still a feeling of having a me. I am drinking my tea. I am worried. But there's still, it's still very helpful, even at this more beginning level that there is suddenly a seeing that I am not the worry. You know, I am not whatever, I'm not identified with whatever's arising. There's this awareness, and their awareness, you know, still has a feeling of, of me. There's a bit of ego clinging in that, but that's okay. This is a practice that deepens over time. How does it feel if you're the Buddha? You'd have to ask the Buddha, <laughs> but I'll tell you what I've read, what we hear from teachers is that when there's no self, you know, when there's a re resurrection, there's a total resting, there is a dissolving into this continuity of everything. There's no me, there's no you. There's only just part of this total connected, awareness with no separation. I'm not separate from you or anyone else. There's a unity there. And there is, with the Buddha, pure clarity and spontaneously arising loving kindness, compassion. So there's a spectrum <laughs> of resurrection, but we've all had a taste of what that feels, right? To come and to rest in this spot where we just put it all down, let the mind relax, and just have that experience that, you know, in this present moment, everything is fine. There's an openness there. So let's, let's practice with that for just a moment. So if you would close your eyes. And just as best you can, just totally relax your mind. So any thinking that's been going on during the talk, just, just let that all go for now and relax the mind. Maybe even just feel your face relax too. Just feel that sensation of just the natural rhythm of the breath. And let go of any attachments to thinking, to stories. And just let whatever arises, you could have sensations that you're aware of or sounds or thoughts, just let them be. Everything's fine. We don't have to hold on, push away. We don't have to change a thing. Just relaxing into this 
openness of no needing to change everything, that everything is perfect just as it is in this moment. Just resting with this relaxed, open mind. And so this is just, perhaps you had just a moment of resurrection there, but this is the mind that we're cultivating And even to say we're cultivating, it's not really correct because it's the mind that we already have. We've just covered it over. So, you know, our practice is to let go and to relax into that mind. There's a Zen teacher, Joan Sutherland, who talks about, you know, we can have these brief experiences of enlightenment. We might call them an enlightenment experience, perhaps during our sitting meditation But she says that having an enlightening revelation isn't the same thing as being enlightened. We have to let the revelation stain and dye us completely in the exact midst of our everyday life. We have to let life teach us how to embody the revelation. So that's, I think, just to say that, you know, we begin to, through meditation, we begin to touch this place And our practice is to, you know, let this continue to broaden, to touch this place more, and not just on the cushion, but as we go through life, through the day, can we begin to just bring this mind back to this place of letting go of thought, of openness and clarity, so that more and more this becomes our life. And it's not just an isolated experience, but it really becomes a mind that's more awake, that's more enlightened. So I have found myself that as this experience grows and increases that with some starts and goes, um, I do begin to live more from this place of the Buddha mind and less from the conceptual mind. And as we experience that in ourselves, we begin to see it in other people as well. You know, when when I'm not lost in obscuration, when I'm in this this place, this home, you know, I can easily see this Buddha nature in myself and others, and I see it in my father. You know, I can go back and see the compassion and the wisdom that shone through when he wasn't covered by his own causes and conditions, when he wasn't being impatient or worried. I see now that those were just arisings. That's not who he was. Those were just causes and conditions that were manifesting in him. But beneath all of that was this this same beautiful Buddha mind that each one of us has. And that gives me great comfort. You know, then to look at anyone in our lives, you know, when we see their Buddha nature, it's not something that can be lost. When the person's no longer physically manifesting, of course we miss them. Of course there's sadness. But we know that who they truly were, you know, this, this awakened being, that that part never dies. And so there's much more of an opening and ease with that. At the time that my father died, I didn't see that. I thought he was his physical body. I thought he was his traits and personality. And I suffered. And fortunately, Seeing things in a different way with these Buddhist teachings helps take away that suffering. So when our practice is resurrection, we can be with death in a way that's both beautiful and profound. And I had the privilege to experience this recently in February when Fred's 102-year-old mother, Ruth, who many of you knew, passed away. Many of you who knew her know that the most important thing in Ruth's life were her family and friends, her relationships. 
Yet, when she was ready to transition, she just let go of all that. There was no attachment. There was no fear and no regrets because she's someone who lived in the present moment. She didn't leave things unsaid. She wasn't living in her thoughts about the past or the future. She lived in the present moment. And so she was very alive. And she was also very ready to let go of that 102-year-old body when the time came. And again, she did that in a very beautiful way. As she transitioned and, and grew closer to the death of her body, there was just this sense of nobility and stillness. It was really quite beautiful. Her mind was relaxed. There was no fear. And there seemed to be a turning inward at that time and a real inner tranquility. Personally, at the time, I was fortunate to be by her bedside for much of this time, and I did experience a sadness with her passing, but it was quite beautiful, and there was no feeling like I had had with my father. There was a feeling totally of, of openness, of spaciousness. There was no despair, no clinging, because I saw the impermanence, and you could really see how beautifully, you know, who she truly was. So there wasn't a lot of thinking. There was just witnessing and gratitude and love to be by her side. You know, with this practice of resurrection, we can also be with life in a way that's beautiful and more profound. We realize when we see impermanence and when we live from this place of direct experience with life, we see how beautiful the present moment is. And maybe you've noticed that some over these last weeks, suddenly we've all been forced, well, not all, I mean, some people are protecting us, taking care of us, but for many of us, we've been forced to slow down to really be in the moment, there's no place to rush off to for many of us these days. So I've been walking um, in a very socially distant way on Riverwalk in Tampa quite a bit, and, you know, suddenly noticing the pods of dolphins. Or the other day I was walking and there was a man who stopped and was looking down at the pavers underneath his foot, feet, and I stopped six feet away and to just see what he was doing. And I realized he was looking at a quote, that there were actually quotations, beautiful quotations on the pavers. And I thanked him. I said, thank you for stopping and looking down. I would never have looked down if I hadn't noticed you doing it. And he said, I've never stopped before. Whenever I've walked out here, I've always been rushing to get somewhere. I've always been thinking about where I'm going. And now I don't have that to do. And suddenly I'm just paying attention and look at this, how wonderful. And I looked down and I was standing over a quote by Martin Luther King that said, faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. And I thought, wow, how wonderful is that? Because here we are in this pandemic and many of us, we want to see the end of the staircase. You know, we want certainty. We want to know how this is going to play out, that things are going to be okay. But Martin Luther King is telling us, you know, take that step, be here, be present to what's here right now. Can we let go of uncertainty? Can we let go of going back, of leaving the home and going back, you know, dying again, as Thich Nhat Hanh would say, dying into our thoughts, dying into our worries. No, this is a moment of resurrection. Come back to the present moment, come back to our true home and just directly experience what is right now. Where am I right now? I'm standing it's beautiful. You know, I can smile. There's another human being. There's a feeling of connection. How wonderful in this present moment. So on this day of celebrating resurrection, you know, we can remember these teachings of impermanence, of continuation, of everything unfolding based on causes and conditions. But we need to take these teachings beyond the intellect and really realize them by living them and practicing them as our teacher Thich Nhat Hanh is instructed, and as our teacher Fred is always instructing and guiding us as well. We can only do this from this place of mindfulness and awareness, of not getting lost in our thoughts. You know, as Thich Nhat Hanh said, as I shared earlier, if you're lost in the future or in the past, you're not alive. But when the seed of mindfulness in you is touched, suddenly you become alive, body and spirit together. You're born again. 
So this is the meaning of resurrection for us as walkers and practitioners of this Buddhist path. 